Amy's out today. Good morning. Let's call our meeting to order, please. We appreciate your being here today. You can tell it's close to the holidays because there's lots of chatter in the room this morning. <laughs> a little excitement in the air, but we do appreciate your taking time out to uh, be here with us this morning. We uh, want to welcome a new board member we have with us today for his first meeting, uh, Sean Sugg. Uh, Sean is from Tupelo area. He uh, is recently has been named president of Toyota Mississippi, which is such a nice honor and a great job and a lot of responsibility, but certainly we all know the uh, role that uh, Toyota is playing in Northeast Mississippi and across the state and uh, the unique um, organization that they have there with uh, cooperation between uh, Pontiac Union and Lee County that they put together to uh, provide for this plant. And Sean will bring to our board a strong uh, background in workforce development and workforce training. And we're excited to have you. Uh, we've already warned him that this is like drinking from a fire hose <laughs> and you learn a whole new language. When they talk about SIG grants and all these things and you're sitting here thinking, what in the world is that? <laughs> well, you'll learn uh, sooner or later. But anyway, we're excited to have you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your uh, being willing. Sean is, has been appointed by the speaker, and we appreciate your being willing because we know you're busy. Thank and you very much. I'm excited to be here. We think there's no greater calling than to provide for the children of the state, and so we, we appreciate your um, uh, giving of your time. Um, our pledge this morning will be led by Dr. Dean, and our invocation uh, will be given by Mr. Bailey. So, if you would stand with us, please. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a father of country. I'm so thankful for the opportunity that we have, the opportunity to assemble together in a free country where we take that for granted so many times. It's so, such a part of being paid for that. We do thank you for that. Lord, so we thank you for the beauty of the day and, and the beauty that you provide for us every day. Lord, so we thank you for the leadership in this room and thank you for the leadership throughout the state and our young people. Lord, so we just ask that uh, you lead, guide, and direct every decision made today in the best interest of young people in the state of Mississippi. Lord, so we thank you for uh, all our leadership in, in our schools and the safety they provide. We pray safety for all our students and our staff throughout the state. Watch over and protect them. Again, Lord, we just ask you to lead, guide, and direct every decision made today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we do have everyone present today except Ms. Baumgartner. She is um, administering tests and felt like she could not be out of her classroom today. So um, we um, do have everyone else here, though. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes of the November 9th, 2017 meeting as they are presented? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the agenda, approval of the agenda. Are there any uh, deletions or additions to the agenda, Mr. Franklin? Can I ask a question, please? Okay. Item number three, Dr. Wright. Backup material. Uh, that was given to you at the board meeting last week, last month. We, I gave you a whole packet last month that had um, all the data that the committee had used, the map of the state, um, the recommendations. So that was given in, in to you Thank last you. month. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Do you need a copy? We need another copy? Okay. 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 All right, then. We'll, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? I move, Madam Chair. Second. second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. We are now to our recognitions, and our first one is the 2017 AP District Honor Roll. Dr. Benton. Good morning, Ms. Altman, Dr. Wright, and members of the board. Today it is my honor to bring before you two individuals or groups. We'll be honoring first, as you said, the district, 
that received national recognition and then our employee of the month. First, we would like to recognize DeSoto County. I think Ms. Russellton is here. If you'll move to the front of the room, please. He also has a team who he will introduce shortly. But let me tell you about DeSoto County. They have been recognized nationally for the eighth annual AP District Honor Roll. Advanced placement programs are highly rigorous programs of study that provide students with opportunities to earn college credit while still in high school. Participation in AP demonstrates to college admission staff members that students who successfully complete these courses can handle the rigor and the expectations that accompany post-secondary work. DeSoto County is one of 447 school districts in the United States and Canada to be recognized by the College Board with placement on this year's honor roll. It's important to note that this is the third time in that eight-year period that DeSoto County has been honored. To be included, DeSoto County had to increase the number of students who participated in advanced placement programs while increasing or maintaining the percentage of students earning uh, a score of three or higher on those accompanying uh, AP exams. Reaching this goal demonstrates that DeSoto County is committed to providing equitable access to all students while improving the overall student performance. They are identifying motivated students who are ready for advanced learning opportunities. This achievement by DeSoto County's school district is in keeping with the State Board of Education's commitment and our department's commitment to expanding the availability of AP courses. Mississippi has seen continued growth over the past few years in our AP participation and performance ratings. This past year alone, 9,369 students participated in AP programs, and that's a 14% increase from the previous year. That's very significant. In addition to that, not only are more boys and girls having that opportunity for advanced coursework, they're actually scoring much higher on those AP exams. Among minority students, the, stu the number of students scoring a three or higher increased 28%. That is significant. Clearly, as one of our larger districts, actually the largest district in our <laughs> state, the efforts of DeSoto County played a huge role in these tremendous gains that we've seen at the state level. Mr. Usselton, he's very humble and he gives credit where credit's due. And he has stated that it's those teachers in the classroom, the students and their families that are supportive and working so hard and those administrators that are leading those buildings that really have made this honor possible. We congratulate you today and your entire team on making such a positive difference in the lives of boys and girls in DeSoto County. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to thank Dr. Wright and uh, board members for inviting us uh, here today. We're very excited to be here. We've got uh, eight people here in attendance with us today. I'd like to introduce to you. Okay, we got seven of our eight high school principals. Uh, principal of Lewisburg High School, Mr. Chris Fleming. Principal of Isle Branch High School, Mr. Jacob Stripling. Principal of High School, Mr. Dwayne Case. Principal of Horn Lake High School, Mr. Andy Orr. Principal of Lake Former High School, Ms. Rhonda Geis. Principal of DeSoto Central High School, Mr. Cliff Johnson. Principal of South Haven High School, Mr. Shane Jones. And our Executive Director of Secondary Education, Mr. Jeff Gilbert. As you mentioned, uh, they're one of the big reasons why we were able to receive this honor today is because their commitment and their buildings uh, to helping all of our students to succeed and helping those students who uh, want to get a head start on college and want to earn college credit uh, while in high school, they're assisting them. Uh, just like you mentioned with the board member earlier, we invited uh, teachers, all, all of our principals who are here invited their AP teachers. This is an exam day, and one of the reasons why we're so successful is our teachers don't want to leave their students today uh, to come down, and so they wanted me to thank the board and uh, Dr. Wright also uh, for, for inviting them down. But we're uh, very excited about the award. It's something that our, our principals 
uh, strive to make sure that all of our students have that opportunity to see, to see no matter if it's someone who's uh, a student who's needing remediation, uh, no matter if it's someone who's uh, going into career technical education or for someone who's college bound, we want to make sure that each of them has that jump start, that head start, so they can be successful in life. And on behalf of uh, the Southern County School Board, our principals, teachers, and all of our staff, I want to thank you, Dr. Wright. And I want to thank our, our board members for all their continued support, not only for Southern County. Our final honoree today is our December Employee of the Month. This month's theme is loyalty and commitment, and today we honor Mrs. Janice Grant. Janice is the Driver Education Supervisor in the Office of Safe and Orderly Schools. Janice is always positive, and she encourages everyone in her department to work together to, comp to accomplish whatever the goal or task may be. She goes above and beyond to motivate them to be their best, regardless of the situation, and she holds herself to those same high standards. She has a great attitude when confronted with challenges and obstacles, and she ha is always calm and steady, and that's an important characteristic to have. She assists other divisions throughout the department. She's willing to, to jump in and lend help to a colleague to accomplish a deadline, a tight deadline, and she does it so willingly and so professionally. She leads by example, and she adheres to a code of personal ethics that builds trust with those with whom she works. Yesterday, I had the privilege of dining with Miss Janice, and let me tell you firsthand, I saw how much her colleagues respect her, how much they enjoy spending time with her. She's a good listener, uh, she's dependable, and like I used the word earlier, steady. Um, and just makes everybody feel like they are of that, uh, value and what they have to say is so, so very important. We appreciate your commitment to the work that you do every day. Your love for your job is clear in your words and your actions, Janice. And we are just so blessed to have you as a member of the Mississippi Department of Education workforce. Thank you for what you do. And I just would like to thank my co-workers for seeing who I am and pushing me also. Uh, my division director, Dr. Welch, I want to thank you for making sure that I take this job and be serious about it. Dr. Vandiver, thank you. Janice, uh, Shannon, and Donnie Gray, they're the ones that nominated me for the Employee of the Month, and I just want to thank them. And each and every day, as uh, Dr. Ben said, I come to work and I try to come in with a positive attitude. Uh, the challenges that we meet, uh, not only through driver's education, but also working pupil with them with pupil transportation and school safety. Uh, it's the last, what, about six months. Uh, we were without our transportation director and Dr. Wells trusted my decision and, uh, and helping those that put in, you know, came in and came aboard to help them to learn something about pupil transportation. I have this thing I tell everyone, I'm not a person that comes to work with high heels and stockings on every day, because a lot of days I have to get out and go and inspect school buses. <laughs> <laughs> so I learn a lot uh, from my former co uh, co-workers about pupil transportation. And you know, once you get in it, you have a love and a passion for school buses. The same thing as it is for driver's education. And thank you very much. I confess to you, I've always wanted to drive a school bus. <laughs> I, I bet you can make that happen. <laughs> now I know who to contact. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, we'll have our uh, report from the state superintendent. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. Good morning um, and welcome, uh, Sean, to uh, our board. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet him a few years ago. Actually, I think it was my first year I was here and just incredibly impressed uh, when I went to uh, the Toyota plant and found out all the wonderful things that they are doing for the children in that area. And uh, so it was just a delight to know that the speaker reached out to you and, and tapped you for our board. We're really proud to have you here. Uh, j briefly, um, the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers had their annual policy forum and uh, I was fortunate enough that Dr. Kelly was able to be there and that was when I was officially sworn in as president of their board of directors and so I'm really very excited about that opportunity and uh, as I've said, uh, my platform for the year is going to be focusing on early childhood education. Should be no surprise to anybody that knows me. Um, and so we're really going to be pressing hard uh, nationally uh, to advance um, early childhood education. Uh, I also attended the National Summit on Educational Reform. That is Governor Bush's um, annual conference, um, Excellence in Education. And uh, it was nice. There was about 10 chiefs that got an opportunity to meet with him privately for about 45 minutes. Uh, and he was very, he's an amazing listener and very interested in what was happening in education in each of our states and what were some of our challenges and, um, and how could the foundation continue to support us. And the foundation's just been an amazing partner with MDE uh, and continues to be an amazing partner, but it was really a, you know, a delight to be able to be in the room, uh, you know, with him to, to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So my tours have been amazing. I am down to the last two, but since the board meeting um, last month, I have been to Boonville, Union, DeSoto, Oxford. Dr. Elam was kind enough to, to be at that one. Uh, Ocean Springs, Biloxi, uh, Long Beach, Madison. Dr. Dean was kind enough to be to that one. Uh, Clinton, Miss Altman was surprise, surprise, was at that one, uh, and Pearl. And um, the anecdotes are just kind of amazing. Uh, you know, the little young man at Oxford, you know, I think he was a fifth grader, and uh, not the shy fifth grader, um, but he was being recognized because this child achieved a perfect score on the math test which is no small feat. And then just went on to tell everybody, but he was always the first one done in his class. Um, he was really cute. Uh, and in Ocean Springs, uh, Benita really, um, talk about AP, she really went all out for her AP students. Um, she had been originally a part of the NIMSI project uh, around the advancement of getting more and more kids in advanced placement. And when uh, NIMSI, uh, that grant ended, her board felt strongly enough about it because the NIMSI grant had allowed uh, uh, Dr. Coleman to give every student that passed an AP exam $100. And their board felt so strongly about it that they said, even though it's gone, we're gonna continue it. So I may have this number wrong, but I believe last year's dollar amount was around $17,000. This year's dollar amount was $35,000 that these kids were given. So you talk about kids with smiles coming across the stage, because some of them may have only been getting one envelope, but some of them are getting like one and two and three <laughs> and four. So I really, um, and hats off to her about that. Uh, Clinton as well recognized um, their, what they call the 30 plus club which is all those kids that are um, have achieved a 30 or higher on ACT. They had two students um, who had perfect scores. Uh, and one of the young men, uh, he was so cute, he came up and introduced himself to me. And, and I said, so I understand, you know, you're the one with the perfect score. And he goes, well, Dr. Wright, it wasn't exactly perfect. And I said, oh, and he said, I guess he's taken it four times. He goes, no, it was like 35, 36, 35, 36. I said, well, sweetheart, that's close enough to a perfect score. But uh, he was really, really funny. Um, and then, of course, Pearl, uh, we were at yesterday, and it was the first time that they had been an A. And uh, we were in uh, the high school auditorium. And I mean, when I say to you it was standing room only, it was standing room only. Every seat was filled. The balcony was filled. And the beauty of all of these um these celebrations, as you, everybody comes. I mean, the mayors come, the board of supervisors come, uh, legislators came, uh, community members, and that's just, uh, it's so wonderful to see that large of a commitment on the part of everybody to ensure 
that, um, that the students are recognized and the teachers are recognized and the administrators are recognized. You know, I get asked, you know, what do you see that's in common? And you, the first thing I think about is community because there's not one time that I've not been at any of these celebrations that um, that the chief of police, you know, the chief fire of the fire department. I mean, everybody is there to celebrate um, their schools. Uh, and you, when you walk through classes, you see kids that are engaged. You see teachers that are engaged. You see technology being used in an amazing way. Kids working in small groups. Kids working individually. Um, you see a lot of data uh, being used to drive instruction, uh, tremendous board support. I don't think there was one that I was at that didn't have almost everybody in, from the board that was there. Um, and then the other part that I loved was just like people were celebrating the achievement of children. And, you know, you had choirs and you had madrigals and, you know, show choirs and bands and cheerleaders and dance teams. I mean, it was everybody coming to celebrate, you know, um, the wonderful achievement. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. So tomorrow I go to um, Enterprise and Newton. And then that will make all um, all 15. But uh, thanks to those of you that were that were able to come to those things. Um, before I go on to recognition and spotlight, I wanted to draw your attention uh, to to a packet that you have on your table. Um, you have received um, a couple of letters uh, from the folks of Noxabee and Humphreys counties, and so I want to make sure we copied all of that for you. So um, you've got that as we uh, move into that discussion a little bit later. Uh, for recognition, I really want to tell you, you know, we don't think about, um, we recognize our employees of the month, but let me tell you what you've got going on uh, inside the department that you may not be aware of. Uh, Lemuel Eubanks, is Lemuel here today? Okay, so Lemuel has been nominated for the Arts Educator of the Year, and they were nominated by the Mississippi Art Education Association, but this is for the National Award. So you need to know that the person who's responsible for all that in Mississippi is now being nominated for the national award. And I think that says an awful lot. Lemuel has done an amazing job with what he does. But in addition to that, you've got people that are serving on national or uh, national committees. Um, Marla Davis, uh, Dr. Davis is serving on the National Association of Educational Progress Mathematics Framework Revision Team. Uh, Dr. Oakley is a member of the Center on Innovations of Learning, the League of Innovation Innovators Design Team, and the Southeast Comprehensive Center Advisory Board. Uh, Dr. Sanja Robertson has just been asked to present at a national conference for the Society of Research on Educational Effectiveness. Dr. Kimiana Burke is going to be a presenter at the National Reading League in New York on our initiative, Literacy Initiative. Uh, Mike Mulvihill and Jean Massey serve with the SREB Leadership Conference. They do our presentations around computer science. Uh, Gretchen Cagle um, has done a national presentation for the Council of Administrators of Special Education uh, in Nevada. Robin Lamonis has done a presentation at the International Dyslexia Association Conference. And Dr. Benton not only serves on CCSSO's um, Federal funding, uh, she did a federal funding presentation in St. Louis, but she has also been named the chair of CCSSO's Deputy Leadership Committee. So you've got a lot of folks to be very proud of who are out representing Mississippi just so ably, and I want to make sure that they get recognition for doing that. And the last folks I want to recognize um, Dr. Malone. I say that Dr. Malone needs to be recognized. She just received her doctorate. Is Dr. Lisa White in the room? No. Nope. All right. And last but not least, my very own special <laughs> chief of staff, Dr. Washington Cole. Oh. All right. So couldn't be prouder. I was prouder. wondering about that. <laughs> Couldn't be prouder of our folks. That's a, a lot of hard work, and as I've said to Washington, you know, that's it's an achievement that you need to be proud of, and um, it's something that's that's everlasting. And so, I'm very proud of the folks that have gone above and beyond to to get that done. Uh, today's spotlight uh, features the Mississippi School of the Arts, uh, affectionately known as MSA, uh, located in Brookhaven, and it is one of our four uh, state special schools. Uh, as a residential school that you, as a board, oversee. 
Uh, they provide a very challenging arts education for um, gifted uh, students in Mississippi in 11th and 12th grade. And MSA enables students to develop and grow as artists as they prepare for the demands of college. Uh, we're fortunate that we've got this specialized program because not all states do, uh, and they really are nurturing uh, the future of our children where art um, and performance is concerned. And I want to recognize the folks that are here today. Um, the executive director, Suzanne Hirsch, is here. Uh, and also the foundation chair, Bill Sones, is here. And foundation members, uh, Danita Hobbs and Amy Jacobs, are here. So we welcome you very much. And uh, we're going to play the video. Uh, and so you get to see what happens at MSA on a regular basis. What you've taken at Mississippi School of the Arts is a group of students from all over the state that have potential um, to be extraordinary artists. They are very creative thinkers and problem solvers, and so they, you put them all in this one residential environment and you end up with this extraordinary place that creativity just thrives all the time. And they do everything from classic work to contemporary and abstract. The students find their own voices as artists and then when they leave here they're ready for a collegiate level of study. Our board is the State Board of Education and we are one of four special schools for the state of Mississippi um, that provide special learning opportunities and educational opportunities for the, the needs of the state of Mississippi. At MSA I study dance under Miss Tammy Stanford um, and we learn ballet, modern, composition, and improvisation and those are like our main focuses. And then as a senior, we also do senior focus, which caters more to like what career we want to do in dance. I plan to go to college, preferably in the Northeast, New York, that general area. Um, and my end goal after going to college is I want to be a part of a modern dance company that travels. So something similar to like Alvin Ailey, David Dorfman, those names. Um, but that's like my premier goal. You get to choose your roommates, but you may not always get what you picked. When I came my junior year, uh, I was with people who I didn't really know, and so you get to form like really strong bonds with people who will hopefully last forever. But then this year, I got to choose my roommates with like my friends who I accumulated over my junior year, and just spending my last year in high school with people who I really love and bond with, and we all share the same interests. It's really fun and interesting, and it just elevates the whole senior year experience and the last hurrah before we're an adult and we got to get our grind on and be professional in life. <laughs> the traditional school day is normally 8 to 3 uh, or 8 to 3.20. Um, however, our students have an extended school day. Um, that school day uh, starts at 8 and it ends at 5. It's really tough, but our students rise to that and um, they're very successful uh, after being here a few weeks. They're not only getting this amazing creative experience, but they're also getting this real-world production experience that they really need to be able to have a career in this field. So it opens a lot of doors when they go to college. They're sometimes two years ahead. We've had students be exempt from classes in their arts for, art forms because of the level of instruction that they've had here and that they're so prepared. So when we apply to the Art School Network for the Exemplary Art School designation, we, we put all of that in there. They evaluate not only our arts experiences that the students have, but they look at the total package of what we're giving these students. And to say that we are so small and that we're able to give such a rich experience to the students makes a really exciting educational opportunity that I really wish the entire state could have. When the Art School Network sees all of these things and they've seen it all on paper, they realized that we deserved the Exemplary Art School designation. And 17 schools across the country receive this honor. It's an exciting thing for us because this is an international membership agency and the Art School Network is the only agency in our country that works with schools of the arts. And so we were looked at by our peers, we were looked at by our colleagues and those people who've been around a lot longer than MSA um, to be able to, to say that we have merited that recognition by them goes above and beyond anything we could ever hope for. Well, my department's the music department, and at this point it's vocal music. We don't have instrumental yet, 
Um, and like all the other uh, areas, I have students from all over the state. They had to audition to get in and interview. So we have a lot of uh, students who are here because they want to be. And they're like-minded in that they're here to work on whatever their area of art is. With me, obviously, it's music. Uh, and they have a lot of performance opportunities they might not see at a uh, regular high school. They get familiar with what is expected in preparation of music, uh, wh whether you're doing solo work or you're involved in an ensemble, what that process looks like. Uh, and so the expectations don't surprise them when they go to college. They're really, they're ahead of the curve. In addition to my academics, I'm a theater major at MSA. I definitely want to stay in theater, take any opportunity I can regardless if it's regional theater, uh, if I have to do tech crew for a while and then work my way up. I know that's usually how it works in theater. You have to work your way up to the lead roles. So I'm willing to put in the time. If you're bored around here, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> because there's always something for you to try. We've got monologues and we have senior scenes that we perform where the juniors read plays and then we perform scenes from them that we take turns directing. And we do everything. We do light, sound, costumes, direct the scenes. After being here at MSA, I don't think I could ever go back to normal high school. It's everything I've hoped it'd be and more. I genuinely enjoy school. While I do have my normal academic classes, if it's available for your schedule and classes that you've taken, you can get college classes done. So I've taken as many college classes as I can get and I feel like it's gonna get me better prepared for college. Not only the classes, but also living in a dorm. And I know that I can handle myself. I know that I can get my work done. And my parents have seen the growth in me as well. They say I'm much more responsible and they know that they can trust me to do what I need to do in college. Ever since I was like middle school, high school, you know, I, I read all the time and I was always interested in writing and teachers always told me I was good at it, and, you know, like, but there wasn't really like a way to do that, you know, often every day there. And I heard about the school having a writing program, so I immediately took the opportunity and I got accepted into literary arts. I really hope to pursue a degree in creative writing and further that maybe become you know, an instructor one day. Yeah, this area we got like all the, the black curtains set up and we have the stage lighting and everything. We have the risers in the back and it's just a wonderful opportunity in the space to like present something. So every now and then a literary artist will come in here to present our coffee house, which is a thing we do monthly where the literary artists come together and we present our pieces that we've written as a way of getting our work out there to the rest of the school. The environment here is it's really open, I guess I would say, compared to old school things are a lot different. You know, people who were creative really didn't have as much of a voice as others. And here I'm left with 100% creative freedom and everyone around here is accepting and open to the ideas that people give off and there's, they, they say it's like a no place, no place for hate, but it's like 100% true when they say that. Our students are really out there and they're making a change in this world and so that's the best gift that we feel that MSA could provide to not only the state of Mississippi but to the students that are growing up here and are learning that they can live in the state and make an impact in a positive way. Congratulations um, to you that it's it's amazing and I think that it's important to, to realize that in educating the whole child uh, the arts have such a powerful powerful place and uh, you've done an amazing job as the executive director uh, to set that tone uh, and we're just so proud of the work that you're doing so thank you very very much <clears throat> and that concludes my report Madam Chair. Uh, this past month, I um, <clears throat> earlier in the month, I spoke to the um, Hines County chapter of uh, Delta Kappa Gamma, which is a um, um, educational organization. And uh, these ladies are, for the most part, were were retired uh, educators, but they carry out that mantra that once you're a teacher or once you're an educator, you're always an educator because they ask uh, very um, pointed questions. They were very interested in what goes on here and what's going on in schools across the state. And so it's always encouraging to me when I speak to these groups to know that there's, uh, there's this support group and this base out there that's still engaged in uh, what's going on in classrooms across the state. 
uh, Dr. Wright mentioned, I also attended uh, the excellence meeting yesterday at Clinton High School, and um, I think I think Dr. Cole uh, had the best statement yesterday when we were standing in the room. He said, "You know, excellence looks different." He said, "When you're in a school, excellence looks different," and um, we're very proud, of course, in Clinton of our schools as is every community across the state that are that are uh, A-rated schools. What Dr. Wright didn't tell you is that uh, the the 31st, the 30 plus club had 40 plus students. <laughs> and so uh, that was exciting to see them all in the, in the uh, same room and um, to have them represent the student body um, during this time. They are, they were a, um, fun group they were not hesitant at all to come up and speak to her and tell her their stories we talked to one young man who was uh, who had applied to baylor sanford stanford Stan baylor uh mississippi state vanderbilt and, and he was harvard. waiting to hear from harvard waiting to hear from harvard so i would say the world is wide open to him <laughs> and that's what we want for our children is that uh they have those opportunities and and uh dr potter at ocean springs with the ap classes um, there are so many, and I say this everywhere I go, there are so many good things going on in classrooms across this state. And teachers are doing so many good things for our children. We get bogged down in what's not happening, and we should very well focus on that. But we need to celebrate those people who are doing it right, doing it correctly, and making a difference in the life of a child. You just cannot do anything more greater, and it's a real... Um, calling to me and it's a real calling to people around this table that we prepare our students for a future and i i think our future is bright because of what i see happening in classrooms and in schools and in communities around the state so um absolutely do we have uh subcommittee reports dr elam um, Academic Achievement Subcommittee met yesterday. Um, everybody was present, Mr. McLeod, Franklin, and myself. And uh, we had a lengthy meeting. We, we actually hung in there till from uh, 3.30 till 5. And we spent um, a short time uh, celebrating the accomplishments of many of the staff members um, in MDE and their national recognition, which uh, Dr. Wright just enumerated. But I would like to... Uh, further enforce how proud we are of what um, the staff, particularly in this case in academic achievement, are doing and giving Mississippi national recognition education. We also learned about a meeting that was held just, re just this week about the uh, concerning the principal advisory group and the excitement that there was at that meeting surrounding the fact that the principals attending were given the opportunity to express um, their observations of what was needed in, in their respective schools um, and also what their successes had been. So there was a great sharing situation that Dr. Benton reported everybody was extremely excited about, both the staff at MDE that were in attendance and the principals um, likewise. Um, then we had a uh, lengthy discussion and report on uh, from what's happening in the Office of School Improvement. And the meetings that have been occurring uh, just this week um, to meet with all schools individually, uh, representation from those schools, including the principal and importantly, a community member and a member of the board of their school board on uh, these were all schools that uh, unfortunately were uh, earned an F grade, um, but they were all the schools that had received the accountability of F and the staff at MDE work, worked with them to develop and uh, approve plans for what they're going to do to improve their schools and hopefully in the not too distant future become C schools. Um, this is a new advancement, a heavy lift for um, MDE staff because of all the intensity of these meetings, but they wanted to get them all done during the month of December so that these schools that were F in their accountability were able to get move forward rapidly with their plans to change that status. 
I think that, that we need to really thank all the work that the academic achievement um, staff have done in this behalf. And then finally, we looked at the kindergarten um, uh, read readiness assessment results, and I'm not going to say any more than we had a uh, discussion about those because Dr. Benton will be giving uh, you a presentation on that later in the meeting. All right, thank you. Good report. Okay, any other reports? All right, then we will move into our discussion items, um, our board items. The first one is um, approval of MDE contracts. Uh, we have um, two. Monthly, we have one monthly contract and one with Dr. Chris Domaleski. Dr. Gavin. Good morning. We do have uh, two items for approval. The monthly contracts with former state employees receiving retirement benefits. You have a list of all of those. And then our second item is a contract with Dr. Chris Domaleski to provide uh, consultant services as and serving as chair of the TAC committee. Okay. Um, I think we're all familiar with the work that um, Dr. Domaleski has done for us and the, re and the valuable resource he continues to be. Do you have any questions on any of these others? Move to item two, approval of uh, MDE grant awards. We have one grant that we're seeking approval on, and it is for MCOPs. We have uh, 50 school districts that were awarded for a total of $1.680 million. I might just give a brief explanation of what the MCOPs award, uh, grant is. I think most of us are familiar, but... Um, right. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, the MCOPS is an annual um, item um, in accordance with statute that funds school resource officers, um, local school districts um, at $10,000 each, and the district um, provides a 50 a 69 uh, according to 50 districts, which will fund 150 officers in um, 309 schools. I might want to pull your microphone a little, yeah, a little closer. closer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Are there any questions, Dr. Dean? Sorry, sorry to go back really briefly on the Domaleski. Uh, this was a recent RFQ that was out. How many respondents were there? Was there um, one response. Any other questions? Are any questions? Uh, oh. on the, uh, did we have a contract with him uh, on his last work, or was that just a one time deal? Back to Dr. Domaleski. So we have annual contracts with Dr. Domaleski. He's been supporting the agency in the areas of assessment and accountability um, for a number of years now and serving as the chair of the technical advisory. Last amount. Um, I want to say um, it was a high 50s last year. About the same amount as you It was 45,000. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, well, there you go. I'm sorry, say that again. 45,000. 45, so. And that one was for how long? It was an annual contract. It was for a year. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any, any, I'm sorry, Dr. Kelly. On the uh, MCOP, um, what's the primary criteria that you all judge for, for, for these awards? So let me ask Dr. Welch. Um, he can he is part of that process. You know right off how many school uh, districts apply that that were not funded
I think that's what. Did you say there were 19, though, that, that applied that didn't meet the criteria? That applied. <coughs> Any other questions, Mr. Franklin? My clarification. We're going from 45,000 to 57 in Dr. Domelis. That's correct. Okay, we ready to move on to number three? All right, item three is approval of recommendation one or recommendation two uh, from the Achievement School District Planning Committee. This is for the Mississippi Achievement School District. You have the backup under tab three. So I want to introduce, um, while we're getting the uh, PowerPoint set up, um, Dr. Benita Coleman. Uh, Dr. Coleman um, has chaired um, the um, Achievement School District Task Force, and she continues now to chair the Achievement School District Planning Committee. So I've asked her to um, do the presentation uh, and give you a little bit of context so that you'll understand how we got to the recommendations, um, the, how the committee got to the recommendations that it did. Good morning to the Board of Education, President Altman, as well as Dr. Wright. For the past two years, we have been working um, with a set of data really around the achievement school. And specifically, I'd like just to take you through a short slide presentation and get directly to those recommendations, um, as well as the backup that supports those recommendations. Of course, um, every presentation at the department starts with the vision and mission, and, uh, and hopefully you will also see that reflected in our recommendations as well as the thought process that went behind those recommendations. Um, in terms of the goals of the State uh, Board of Education, we also kept those in mind, specifically goal number six, where our intent in the state is that every school and district will be rated as a C or higher. When we actually pulled up the Mississippi Code and, and we actually looked at the Achievement School District Law and it's referenced 3717.17, you'll see that the purpose of the law was really to transform persistently failing public schools and districts throughout the state into those quality educational systems. And of course, that's done through our rating systems. Um, also, the law specifies that the Achievement School District will be a statewide structure. And very early on, the task force made the decision that we would actually look at school districts as opposed to schools, um, simply because of the complexity of setting up a separate school district with schools uh, and the funding mechanism would, we thought, be prohibitive. When you look at it, you also see that the Achievement School District, according to law, could not be confined to any specific geographic boundary, which meant that it was a statewide process in terms of looking at school districts um, that were considered to be <clears throat> The law also specifies that this board, the State Board of Education, is the governing board uh, and provides governance and oversight um, for the Mississippi Achievement School District. And also, uh, I know that the board is in the process of selecting a superintendent for the Achievement School District as well. So specifically, when we dealt with the legislation, and this was House Bill 989 um, that set up the ASD, it came out of the 2016 session, and we have been actually studying on a monthly basis ever since that point um, the specific data that came um, from the Achievement School District body. You'll see that we very early on, as I forestated, we recommended districts and not schools, and also when the law went to effect in July 1 of 2016, we started to look at not only the broad criteria that the legislation uh, required, but also we tried to refine that as well. That ref those refined recommendations were brought to this Board of Education, um, and you approved those on October 19th of 2017. So when you look at what the law specifically says, the law specifically says that you have to be an F district for two or more years, two consecutive years. But we also thought that it was incumbent upon us to refine that to make sure we were providing a triage of, of services in terms of the districts that really needed emergency um, support and control. So we also added two additional qualifiers. Those two additional qualifiers are number three and number four. So not only would the school district have to be an F for two consecutive years, which the law requires, but also the school district would have to have 50% or more of the schools as rated an F and or 50% or more of their students in F schools. And so with those two additional qualifiers, the task force felt as though we were absolutely looking at the school districts that were the most severe, the most in need, 
and also those school districts that were not on a trajectory um, currently of really providing additional support to those schools to turn those situations around. We specifically dealt with data, and I think that is the most important um, point that I would like to, to specify during this entire recommendation. We dealt with a body of data and we ran those numbers over and over. And so when we looked at those numbers and we also made sure that, that we also looked at the department's ability to make sure that they were able to provide that support, those recommendations from the body, and we took a, a full vote of the entire task force, came forth as an option one and an option two. And we like to present those recommendations to the state board for approval today. Our option one or our first recommendation would be Noxubee County and Humphreys County School District. And the backup when we look at, as I said, those qualifiers is that for Humphreys County Schools, they have 1,240, I'm sorry, 1,691 students in terms of enrollment. And when you look at the enrollment in F schools, that number is 1,246, which is 73.7% of their students are actually in F schools. Um, when you look at the number of schools that Humphreys County has, they have four schools, and three out of four schools right now are classified as an F. Noxubee County um, has a total enrollment of 1,623 students and an enrollment in F schools of 1,145, which is 70.5% of their students. And in terms of the number of schools, four out of five schools are in F. And so that is why for us, we felt as though those two school districts were going to be our first <coughs> recommendation to the State Board of Education. But we also felt it was incumbent, and there were members of the committee who felt strongly that it was important to provide and be very transparent with the Board of Education. And when we, uh, when we applied those two qualifiers, we had an additional district that also would come into the fold. Um, and when we looked at those numbers, Jackson Public Schools had 27,064 uh, students at the enrollment period that we looked. And they had 13,690 students in an F school, which is 50.6% 50 50 of students in an F school. So you also see the variance there between 70% um, and 50%. And when we looked at the number of schools, they had 51 schools, I'm sorry, 58 schools, and 30 of those were in F, which was 51%. And of course, you see the variance there. Again, um, option two is strictly because we thought it was important to be very transparent with the board and provide all information in terms of all school districts that actually met those qualifiers. Um, so for us, um, we are presenting to you today our recommendations, option one, as well as option two for the board to act in terms of moving schools into the Achievement School District. Thank you, Doc, uh, Dr. Coleman Potter. We, I, I know you've spent a lot of time on this, yeah. And plus, you've been running a school district, so we appreciate a very successful school district, I might add. Uh, so we appreciate the work you've done on this and the time and the effort you've given to it. And uh, to get to this point, I know, has been a yeoman's job, and we thank you for that. Um, you do have uh, this recommendation. Let's discuss it. Anyone have a question or a comment about this? Dr. Dean? Just go ahead and, and get out front. I, I think, you know, the work that's uh, going on right now in, in JPS, uh, the tension uh, that's focused on it right now is uh, very exciting. Uh, I've talked to several folks who have been involved with that process, and, and I'm, I'm comfortable at this point with uh, the, the tension that's going and, and what's happening there. So I'll, I'll just, you know, speak first and say I'm not really for option two. Uh, I think uh, option one uh, with the two, District, I, I guess my question is: is, there, is it possible to do an option three where we just can pick one of those two, or is it do we have to by law? Maybe this is a legal question uh, that that uh, we have to accept this recommendation, or since this is our first go at it, does it make more sense maybe just to to walk before we we run a little bit and just pick one of those two, or do we have to accept this? Well, both have been recommended to you. I understand your question now. So the, the, I, I get these recommendations have been brought to us, and, and the criteria, uh, these three districts meet the criteria for ASD, 
And if we have option one, where because you know we acknowledge what's going on at JPS and say, okay, there's enough focus on that, we're comfortable with that. That's sort of what we're saying. If we go with option one, but is there an option three where we say this is our first go at ASD? So can we just pick either Knox B or Humphreys and just do one instead of two at a time for our first time? So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking a legal question: Can we essentially say option three, Knox B, option, option four, Humphreys? Yeah, but there's nothing in statute that, that designates a number, if that's your question. There's nothing in statute right. that requires that. Not so much that. the number, but we can, take like, like we've done before, take recommendations, change them, and then you know, go with that. Absolutely. Not even being recommended. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Franklin. A couple of questions, please. Uh, did you say there's a group that's going to continue working like this work group or an advisory group that's going to continue working on this issue well once the you make a determination about which um, district then we're also in the process of you know we've advertised for the superintendent and that I believe closes at the end of the month so we're hoping to do those interviews in January uh, dr. Kelly is uh, representing you on that committee uh, and hopefully bring a superintendent's name to you in February so then that person would be the person that would be leading the work certainly the support of this committee as needed but that person would be leading the work Action that we're going to utilize and bring in these districts up to speed. And the second is, you know, leadership. You know, when are we going to get leadership for this? So you you just answered, I think, the second one. You're hoping to. Well, do and that. I think that's really, you know, I don't want to dictate to the new superintendent, you know, what his or her um, actions might be, you know, in that district. I think that's the reason we're looking for a strong leader. We've advertised nationally uh, in a variety of venues, and so. Uh, that would be a conversation that I would want to have with that superintendent rather than me telling the superintendent. I don't tell superintendents right now how to run their district, so I wouldn't want to be telling this superintendent how to do that. But I think that um, we, they would certainly have the support of anybody at MDE and anybody on the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, go ahead, Mr. McClendon. Go ahead. I, I was going to ask, what uh, I missed this, what percentage of... Uh, students in Humphreys County in your report um, are in F schools. Did you? 73.7%. Um, okay, I missed that. Okay. All right, Mr. McClellan. I would also like to uh, piggyback on uh, what Dr. Dean was saying about option two, especially for Jackson Public Schools. I've had an opportunity to, to work with uh, Better Together Commission. And there is no question in my mind that Jackson Public Schools is beginning to head in the right direction. When they eliminated that the previous board and reappointed a board, it is kind of unbelievable of the responsibility that they had to take knowing that Jackson Public was in a dire need <clears throat> of a different direction. <clears throat> That board have taken the bull by the horn to make sure that things change in the Jackson Public School from <clears throat> please excuse me. From the curriculum in to saving all of the schools from A to Z. I think it would be pretty harsh at this point uh, with the momentum that that is being put forth to change Jackson Public Schools, to put them in the Achievement School District and let this work go uh, go, to, go to waste. Well, I think, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you're not finished, go ahead. No, I'm gonna preach a little go, while. Go on, on. Go I on. haven't got, got any amens yet. <laughs> you took a breath, so I was ready to jump in. <laughs> I don't think it's anyone that's in this work area of Jackson Public School would say that they are not in dire need of a different direction. In regards if they go into the Achievement School District, uh, if you allow them to go forward what's already in place, it's not going to change it overnight. But you can see already there's emphasis being placed on community engagement. I think when we decided that 
we wanted to try and put Jackson the Public uh, in a state of emergency, that it opened the eyes of all of the parents and the stakeholders uh, in and around Jackson and in Jackson. And to take them now and put it, I'm not sure that we would even have the ability to handle 25 to 27,000 students at the present time. So I said that to say this. I hope that our colleagues will, will give uh, the commission an opportunity to work with Jackson Public Board to change this. And if, if so, I think you're going to see in the very near future a real change in what happened in Jackson Public Schools. And that's all the Achievement School District could do is to try and give them a different direction. And I thank you for your time. Well, I think the general consensus of the board would, and I'm not, the, would be to let the governor's plan and the, and the group that's working move forward with Jackson. I, I hope the board I, will. I do that. think that what this group has, has brought forward is the fact that it further underscores the need in the Jackson Public Schools for a different direction. Um, but I do think people are in place and, and things are happening that would hopefully change that direction. But it doesn't diminish the sense of urgency that should be uh, going on in the Jackson Public Schools from building up to your group. Um, that, that things have to change, children are being shortchanged, and that uh, there is a there's plenty of information out there that indicates a change has to be made. So um, I agree with you. Let the plan work until we see how it's going to play out. I think everyone will be real happy with the board that they have in place. They are very sincere about making sure that there's a change in Jackson Public Schools. And that's all we can ask for. Even with the commission, um, there. Uh, we can only recommend to the, to that board. The two chairs of the commission will I ask that we meet with the two chairs of Jackson Public School prior to each of our commission meetings. We've had our first one, and they understand that there have to be a change. They understand that they have to work with the commission in order to get what they need done. And I think it's going to make a great difference with them carrying back to their board by meeting with the commission chairs so that we both be on the same page. And they are open to that. And I don't know of anything else we can do uh, to get it in a different direction than what, what, of what they're doing. And I think you're going to be very proud of that board. Well, we hope so. And I think this board has demonstrated they're willing to make the hard decision if we have to. But the important thing is what happens in that classroom and do we see a difference in the classroom. Dr. Kelly? I, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. Um, I, think every, I think it's fair to say everybody around this table wants what's best for students. <coughs> the mission's plan work. I will be the first one on Capitol Street singing the Hallelujah Chorus because I want it to work. The difficulty for me and the challenge for me is that every other school district in the state that finds themselves in the same position with the same statistics as Jackson, there's this quandary of what do we do with them? Do we give them an opportunity that we have given the Jackson Public School. It puts this board in a precarious situation. It's a quandary for me. I want every school district to do well. I would hope all of the school districts on here could come back with a plan that would show us that they are serious about educating students and we don't have to make these kinds of decisions. None of us like making these decisions. It's very tough to make them. But I want Jackson to be successful, and I think everybody around this table wants them to be successful as well. So 
with that, I, I certainly support the idea of, uh, uh, of not looking at option number two at all. Uh, but I want there to be more conversation about option number one. Here's the conversation that I would like to hear. First of all, what Dr. Wright and, and, and Dr. Cole, what school year would we be talking about the achievement school district or these districts going into the achievement school district? Starting in 1819. 1819. Yes, sir. How much, how much would it throw the plan behind time in terms of affecting your timeline, if we were to delay this decision until we get a superintendent on board and hear from that superintendent what his or her vision would be for whoever is in this achievement school district? Well, we're, we're hoping to bring that superintendent to you in February. So if you delayed, it would be then you could do both at the same time. Well, I guess you would have to approve the superintendent first to allow the superintendent to speak and then um, and then ha have that conversation. And yeah, it might be as late as March. I would be much more comfortable knowing who's going to head up the district, hearing a vision from that person before I throw any school district into it. So that may impact the applicants, um, to be honest, because uh, just to give you my, my personal opinion, uh, typically when you're looking for a job and you're, you're kind of wanting to know what the extent of that job is going to be, is it going to be, you know, because is, is, is there going to be a decision made about any of the districts or is it going to be one district or is it going to be two districts and if you decide not to go, but it, let's just say option three, it could be possibly three districts. But, or option two. So that's the only thing that I would see as the downside is that the superintendents that, or the people that are applying for that job are not going to know the extent of the job that they're actually applying for. Does that make sense? Uh, amen. No, Dr. Keller, sir. no, no. I'm, we can do whatever you choose to do. You're the board. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just, just saying, saying he was just saying what, what would said. be... I don't want to drastically alter the timeline right. that would affect the effectiveness of the new superintendent, but I sure would love to hear from the new superintendent. I can see that. I promise you, Chair, that I'm not going to be long-winded of that. You can talk all you want to talk. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I realize, Dr. Party, you said that you all was uh, going to work on the criteria, but but how 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 is one superintendent going to operate uh, from Humphreys County to Knoxville County when they both on opposite ends of the uh, opposite sides of the state? Graphically, um, one of the things that the task force talked about in terms of because the ASD never had geographic boundaries was that there was also an understanding that that person also would have to be regionally located, whatever that region would be. There was never um, any type of forethought about that person would have to be located in either or of the counties that they would actually be responsible for providing administration. It may be that they would be located somewhere in the middle, uh, but that was not necessarily a, a decision that the task force made in terms of where would that person's office be. Um, according to the legislation, um, not only would the boards, but also the superintendents of those school districts be removed. And so with that being said, we always thought that there was an opportunity for them to leverage and figure out what would be the most optimal place for them to reside or for them to work from. They very well could decide to work and live in Jackson and, trans and travel to those particular districts every day or however often. But that was not something that we thought was our our place to actually make the, the residency requirement for the, for that person. The, the, the structure would be that you have the ASD superintendent and then you would have uh, deputy, for lack of a better term, deputy superintendents. If they so chose. Or if they Correct. chose in each district who would, with whom he, would, he or she would work. And you would have your building level people. That it was confirmed. From the, well, the other thing is remember that once the school districts go into the ASD, their funds also go into the ASD. Yeah. So no longer do they operate as separate school system. 
all of those um, funds actually funnel into the ASD. And that was one of the reasons that we made sure to have district business managers on the task force to talk about the coding, but also to talk about how that funding process would work. Because all of those funds that currently sit, if we're just talking about option one in Humphreys and Knoxville County now, would go into the ASD as um, that particular school district. Which is not going to be very much for a 2,000 student district. But it is now, yes, sir. Dr. Eagle? Yes. Um, <clears throat> if you recall, I brought up the issue of identifying these schools before we had a superintendent. That was brought up at the last meeting. I said I, I wasn't comfortable with that and was looked at. And, and Dr. Wright, as she did again today, explained why we needed to move forward with identifying these schools because that would facilitate the selection of the superintendent. So I, I thought we were over that issue and that we were moving forward. In fact, we have moved forward because it is now public information. I guess it's information new to us when we got our packets that these are the two schools that the ASD task force is recommending to take over. So, so they know it, and we heard from them each individually with a letter. So I now, I mean, we, we, as far as I'm concerned, we went over that hurdle at the last meeting. And so everybody seemed to accept what Dr. Wright said. We're now knowledgeable of which schools are likely to be taken over. I say we don't slow down the process. <coughs> we go ahead and proceed with the selection of the superintendent and proceed with having identified who's going to be in the Achievement School District. Now, I want you to note, and I want particularly the press to note, that I said who is going to, ha to be in the school district. I, unfortunately, I think that the media is conveying to the public that this is a state takeover. I mean, we aren't making the distinction for uh, the general public that a takeover by the state is one thing, and having the joining, being part of this new, hopefully very progressive achievement school district is far different. It's not a takeover. It's a privilege to be included in this district that's going to really be the shining light of what can happen in this state. Or at least that's how I, having served with Dr. Coleman on the task force just for one, I guess the first year, and I missed a lot of meetings, I have to say. But Nonetheless, I thought that that was the vision of the Achievement School District. It's not a takeover. It's a privilege to have a new chance. And I just can't, we've talked about which, which school districts are eligible. It's very obvious that I see no reason to start dragging our feet and not proceeding with identifying as a board voting on two districts or three that would be in the school district and let Dr. Wright have that information to help facilitate the selection of the superintendent. I think what um, one of the things Dr. Elam has pointed out is um, uh, there is an economy of scale here. When you have these smaller districts and you join them together, so to speak, um, children in each district have opportunities that they might not otherwise would have had had they just been had they stayed in their own district. Uh, you can offer classes, maybe. You can offer opportunities for them that they might not have. And it is a privilege. We, we can't see it as punitive. It is a privilege to be able to do this. And, and if we can sell the, convey that to the people who are in these school districts, um, it'll be a win-win for everybody. Because we have a lot of small districts out there who can't. Uh, provide all the opportunities for their students and this gives an opportunity. Uh, the other thing I would say is if you are a good, as it relates to, to um, selecting the superintendent, if you are a transformational superintendent and if you are a good superintendent, you know what to do. The criteria is out there. You know what to do when you go into a school system. You know the very basics. You know what has to happen first, what has to happen. The plan is sometimes in your head, and I understand what you're saying, Mr. Frank, but you've done it. You know um, you know what has to be done in school districts. So um, it's up to the board, whatever you want to do. Dr. Dean? Quick question on timeline. I realize February is the anticipated date of hire. Any way to do it by January? 
Well, that would be tough to get it to the board because they, it does not close till the end of the month. So we would have to then, I mean, that would be a quick turnaround in terms of interviews. I mean, uh, and the availability of, um, certainly of Dr. Kelly, I could, you know, staff availability isn't, um, we can try, that's all I can tell you is we can try once I know what Dr. Kelly's availability is. So the end of December, the advertisement would end the end, end of December. December. So and then we would need a day at least to go through all the applications and wean those down and then probably another at least full, at least one full day um, what, of interviews. What is the date of our board meeting? 18th. 18th. Mm -hmm. So that brought you Come back you. on the 2nd. So it gives you about two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks. So I can certainly... Something to shoot for. Yeah. But let me ask you this. Have... Uh, access to know at this if the if the application period ends at the month getting close to the end of what is really this month it seems fourth basically do you have any idea how many people how many applications not off the top of my head we we have received a number of calls i can tell you from people all over um inquiring about this job and the size of the job and um it, things of, of that nature so we've had a lot of interest um, in this position. It's one thing if you have three applicants to evaluate. It's far, far another thing if it's 30. Yeah, we've had more than, I mean, we've had a, a lot. We could certainly find that out. I don't have that off the top of my head, but we can find that out. Mr. Bailey? I understand uh, the gap between the, the, the three districts we're considering with the 70% uh, failing in, in two of them and 50% with JPS. I think what Dr. Kelly was building off of if one of these other districts had brought a presentation to the ASD, the superintendent, that said, we also have a commission and we also have a format, what position would that put the commission or the board in in considering that and making a decision and the consistency associated with that? So I think that's what we were, the, one of the, the concerns Dr. Kelly was, 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 was building into in that uh, if either one of those came as JPS, and we understand the difference in the size and the, and the gap in, in achievement, but if one of those came, what position would the board, this board, or the commission, or the superintendent of the ASD be in in drawing those lines and making a decision on that? I had kind of a similar concern because it seems a little bit with two options as it's being a bit arbitrary that, you know, we're just plucking one off because of this uh, in, enormous positive effort that's going on I'm not detracting from that so I asked you know legal for an opinion what does the law say and the law seems to in my opinion and you know I'm not a lawyer but it seems to give us a great deal of discretion and latitude on how we interpret that it says you may if resources are available and that's really sort of the, the purpose of my the earlier question about can we do a separate option where we just either pick Oxby or Humphreys as opposed to both which I'm not you know against that either but I interpret it as, and if this is you know erroneous, let me know now. We have a great deal of discretion. So if Humphreys or Knox to be in the next, you know, if we delay this and they come and they say we've got an action plan, I think that's worth considering. I mean, it is, and but it's not a shall; it's a may at our discretion as resources allow. No, I was going to say um, the statute specifically says that you would overtake, not overtake, that you would have the achievement school district if you had the capacity to serve. And so, again, you mentioned the office space, which is a requirement by the state board uh, to provide as sort of like the central office for the ASD. So, yes, it could play a part as to whether or not your determination is we have the capacity for both or we only have the capacity for one. I'm sorry. Got Mr. McLean. Oh. Back to uh, Mr. Bailey and, and, and Dr. Kelly. I think it's a great thing to be able to have options uh, and we could handle it on an individual basis. I think we're going to have to start thinking outside the box of what's going to be best for kids in a given district. So I think that uh, is a great thing to be able to have options, uh, whether it's a commission or whatever it is. If it's going to help kids, I think we need to consider it not just a takeover. Uh, Dr. Kelly. Going back to Dr. Dean's recommendation that we perhaps look at one or the other in recommendation number one, going with one school district rather than two. The dilemma for me with that 
is that you have one district with 73.7% of the students in F schools, with three out of the four being Fs. And in another one, you got 70.5 with four out of five. The data is so close. How do you pluck one off over the other? And what have you accomplished? I mean, if we're going to pull one, to me, why not just put them in a conservatorship? Or, try, you know, I, I think just doing one is not an achievement school district. I mean, and, and I'm very sympathetic about, uh, about hiring somebody. That's getting late in the game. That's very appropriate. The other side is we're talking about students, and and I'd rather wait and get it as close to right as we can all be comfortable with. Because I, I, you comment about everybody around this table. Everybody around this table is just about the kids. But we've got the state and the department has a track record of getting involved in local school districts dating back a long time. And the the opinion as to the effectiveness of that is still out there, you know, depends on who you talk to about it, you know. So I'd rather delay and get as much information as possible than I had do something today uh, as opposed to otherwise. That was my whole point. Trying to jeopardize or put it anything at peril of hiring the best person possible, you know, and I understand that from the Ju July 1 comes off there early after March. So I understand that, but again, how do we, all of us with a diverse opinions based on our experiences and that type of thing, how do we, we come together, you know, and, 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 and are comfortable in making really tough decisions about what's best for children? And that was the only point I was trying to make. So thank you. The, the, the only other point I would make is that I'm a proponent of the Achievement School District. I think the model can work. Uh, but if, if we can buy ourselves a little time, it's not backing up, but if we can buy ourselves a little time, I, I think all of us would feel better about it. I know I would. Well, it's, uh, um, Dr. Cole just told me that um, all those things get funneled into you know, the personnel board, you know, somewhere. Um, and they normally take at least four days or five days to transfer all that information back over to us. So those applications then don't come into us. So if you're looking at the end of the month and you're looking probably at the tail end of the first week in G January before we would have the actual applications, which kind of then narrows that window of interviews um, that much shorter. Are they, it, are those, I'm sorry, are those applications screened elsewhere before they come here? They're supposed to be screened by the personnel board. But we can also ask for all of the applications to be sent to us. We have the ability to do that as well. And in this case, I would ask for that. Well, and if, if that is the desire of the board, then uh, I think you all might plan your calendar for a special board meeting. You know, sometime, either if we have to do it by teleconference or what. But if, if, the, ti if the time is so um, tight and you want to do it in January, then we would have to have a special board meeting maybe sometime after, depending on how quickly all that can be turned around. Not that we absolutely would have to, but I think that's a possibility if, if that's what the board desires. You have a question? Well, I, I don't know if it's if there's any more comments. I'm premature, but if there's a motion, I would like to, if this is appropriate for motion, I, I don't know if it's required, but I would just like to take option two off the table formally. Because I think there's a lot of concern, and you know, I've certainly gotten calls, and I think other people have as well. Uh, you know, it seems like there's consensus around there. If we need to vote on it, let's vote on it. But then my, my motion would be, you know, to move on option one at such time as the the ASD superintendent has been selected, and and then take it up so that, you know, I just take option two off and table option one until our next, you know, opportunity. I, I I don't think you have to remove option two. I think you. Have to just take option one. Okay, well then yeah. just make it clear to, yeah. to a lot of folks in the room that that's the consensus of the board. If someone disagrees, it'd be a good time to, to say so now. But I think the consensus of the board is enough's going on positively at JPS to just move forward with consideration of option one. Option one. That's your motion. That's, that is my motion. And you don't have to worry about option two. Not time. if we so vote on option one. Rejecting option two. You're rejecting option two. Taking option one. 
All right. Do we Madam have a Chair, second? do we do that now? Or do we do it when we start the Well, vote? no, when we vote. That's right. right. I'm sorry. So that is your recommendation then when the vote comes. That's right. Okay. Any other comments or questions about um, this item? Thank uh, Dr. Dr. clarification. So Dr. Dean's motion that we will vote on when we get around to the voting is to accept recommendation one. Option Period. One. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm off the. Has nothing I'm off to the, do, but 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 it has nothing to do with your motion. Has nothing to do whether uh, Doctor uh, whether we move move forward with enacting this as the achievement school district. Right. Two school district, Humphrey and Knoxville. That that's it. So you're not placing any time frame on it. I just want to be clear what we're going to vote on. Uh, I thought you said table. Well, I was saying, you know, take whatever the the, 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 the issue is, I, and again, I'm assuming consensus here, and we'll have to vote on it at some point, that option two with JPS is not, you know, what the, the desire of the board is. Option one, both of them, to move forward once the ASD person has been selected and hired and we come back at that point. I'm simply trying to send a message that it's the will, of, primarily my, my point is, it's the will of the board that JPS is no longer under consideration of ASD. That's what I'm trying to get at. And the, as far as the timeline goes, maybe we still need to talk about that. Or at least make it two separate op, uh, two separate yeah. motions. Yeah. Okay. I, I, think, I think you're right there because what if, what, what if I wanted to vote to take Jackson Public off the table and, and didn't want to vote for putting those two in the uh, achievement district? What was the proper motion That's here? Because you're going to consider in, in option one. Make a second motion can be to uh, to accept. Why don't we just do one motion at a time? Why don't we just do okay. one motion okay. and then and not because this is this to me is conflating things. I think we need to have one motion. I think Dr. Dean, if I heard you correctly, your motion is to take option two off the table for discussion and vote. Let's take this one at a time. Okay. I can do off the table with my motion. I'll second that. All right. Well, we're not voting oh, yet. So <laughs> hold your second to the proper time. All right. And do I need to make a, a motion that that we will move forward with the formation have to, have of the ASD of these two districts only, effective with our vote? And be effective a today. Vote. Yeah. Is what my my motion is then. That, then that would be once we take option two off the table, then then we would have another motion. Okay. Everybody on on the same page here with this when we get to it. Yep. All right. I think we've achieved what you all wanted it with Thank that, you. and then we'll have the next motion. Thank you, right. Okay. All right. Woo. Okay, option uh, item four is information. This is our kindergarten. Thank you so much for your. Uh, work on this and we'll now move to kindergarten. I hope this will be easier. <laughs> this is good news. This is good news. Dr. Vanford, are you leading this, or Dr. De uh, Dr. Benton, whichever? I'm going to start. Okay. Tag team. We're, yeah, tag team today. Item number four is an information item. Um, we're presenting the fall 2017 kindergarten readiness results. Um, this has been a joint effort between academic uh, and the accountability. Pull your mic just a little bit closer, because remember, we're live streaming, so you need to make sure everybody can hear you. So as you know, the uh, Mississippi K-3 assessment uh, support system was implemented in 2014, and one of the components of that system is the kindergarten uh, readiness assessment. Uh, the kindergarten readiness assessment is designed to measure the readiness skills of students that are entering kindergarten and those that are exiting uh, the pre-kindergarten um, programs. So the report today is going to be a three-year comparison of the students enrolled in uh, early learning collaboratives, um, other funded public pre-kindergarten and public kindergarten. 
And so Dr. Benton will uh, present the 2017 data as well as this comparison to you. Thank you, Dr. Vanderford. And as Dr. Vanderford stated, we have been administering the MCAS Kindergarten Readiness Assessment for the past four years. So we will be providing some trend analysis. And the administration of the K Readiness piece is one of our action steps that support specifically goal three of the State Board's goals, and also it supports goal one. So let's take a look at where we are this year. This year we administered the kindergarten readiness assessment to approximately 36,000 kindergarten students across the state this fall. Within the first month of school, all the boys and girls had completed this assessment. The beginning of the year target score for kindergarten is 530. This year, the average score across the state of Mississippi was 503, which falls below that entry benchmark, that readiness benchmark. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that 530 in just a moment. I wanna remind you that this is the entry level assessment. It's whole purpose is to provide timely information to teachers and to parents about where children are coming in so that we use then that information to inform our instructional decisions and make sure we close that gap and build those strong foundational skills for boys and girls. So what does the 530 mean? When you look at 530 and you think about little ones that come in with a book, when they see this book, they know that it's a book that score 530 falls in the late emergent reader. They are beginning to understand when they sit on the lap or you sit and read with them that the print moves from left to right. They look at the pictures and they start talking about what they see. And many of them will start telling you the story and they call that reading. They're building that language and that's where we expect them to be. And you see that wide band there that 503 is on the lower end of that late emergent reader. And when we come back in the summer, we'll be able to show you the growth and where what the amazing things that have happened in kindergarten classrooms across the state. But let's see where our boys and girls are as they enter. Okay, as you look at this chart, the three-year comparison, you see it's pretty stable. When you look on, the, um, on my right, you see that 36.9% of boys and girls that entered into kindergarten classrooms this fall were at or above the 530 readiness benchmark. And that's just a really small change there. You might be thinking, okay, so we have early childhood now, why aren't we seeing larger gains there? at the readiness and the preparation. I want to remind you that with the early learning collaboratives, we have 14 of those in the state, we are serving about 2,000 children. So to put that in perspective, if we tested 36,000 kindergartners, only 2,000 of those approximately were participants in our four-year-old programs. That's roughly 6% that we're touching. That still leaves 94% or 9 out of 10 children that are coming in that may not have had that opportunity to participate in a high quality early learning um, experience. So I want to tell you though that we know our early learning collaboratives and our high quality pre-K pre classrooms are making an impact. This year we have 20 districts that posted a readiness score above the 530. That's six more districts compared to the previous year. And when you look at those 20 districts, nine of those districts are early learning collaborative districts. That's huge. Also within that 20, we have a number of districts that have invested themselves in pre-K. They've seen the importance They've used the resources they have, be that uh, Title I dollars, IDEA, special education dollars, or local funds to invest. I want to share with you just a, a quote because I thought it was pretty powerful from the superintendent in Western Line. Western Line was one of the top three 
districts in terms of the preparation and the readiness of boys and girls that came in. And um, Larry Green, the superintendent there, says, the 75 students who participate in our pre-kindergarten program and then matriculate into kindergarten have shown learning readiness and assessment measures that far exceed our kindergartners who come to us without the benefit of pre-K. And that's why they continue to make that investment within their, their district. Um, at the school level, as you can see, again, more schools are having children come in better prepared in spite of the fact that we're still only touching about 6% through our early learning collaboratives. I want, let's take a look at our early learning collaboratives and how the children are entering the doors there. Again, this is entry level information. It lets you know where they're starting and when we come back in the spring, uh, late summer or, or early summer, we'll be able to show you the gains in these classrooms. With the pre-kindergarten programs, I'm gonna show you two sets of of uh, metrics here. The Early Learning Collaborative, that's uh, approved legislatively. We have 14 of those across the state, and that's where the approximately 2,000 children are. And then we'll look at other funded classrooms. But with our Early Learning Collaboratives, our children are coming in under their target score of um, 498, where we want them to be at the end. They're coming in at, at 427. That means, as we look at this next slide, that about eight out of 10 children that enter our early learning collaboratives are, are performing uh, below that readiness benchmark. That's what you want to see. This funding is designated to make sure the children that are at the highest risk of not having those readiness skills, they have them. So what this says to me is we're targeting that right population. And what you, what's always exciting when we come back in the summer is to look at just those amazing gains that have occurred because that's really changing lives. That's changing that trajectory uh, of, for, for boys and girls. We see this same trend with our children that are involved in other programs. We have a little over 5,000 boys and girls in our, I'll call them our hybrid programs that are funded from a multiple number of ways. And they scored a little less than the early learning collaborative at 420. But again, as you look at the next slide, almost nine out of 10 children. So we're targeting the right boys and girls, the ones that are the most in need uh, and haven't had that opportunity for that high quality learning experience. So um, what are we doing with the information we have? One thing, it's a priority in our legislative budget request that we add additional funds. Dr. Wright has requested $10 million in our legislative appropriation request uh, so that we can further extend our reach into classrooms. We at the MDE are continuing to uh, provide high quality programming in terms uh, and support in terms of our professional development agenda. Uh, we received the $6 million Kellogg grant that you heard about earlier this year, which will allow us to not only provide professional development for setting teachers in public school settings, but we'll be able to reach back and are reaching back and including child care provider teachers, Head Start teachers, a mom that's keeping her child at home that wants to attend, or grandma, what, whatever the case may be, they're open to anyone that's touching the lives, the life of a little little one. Um, we have a comprehensive early learning assessment that the board approved contractually a few months ago so that we're really looking at the whole child. And in addition, we are continuing to provide resources such as the literacy center activities that we are giving to teachers. Uh, we're revising our pre-K and kindergarten guidelines with the assistance of teachers in the classroom, both child care teachers outside of the public setting and those within. With districts, we are uh, all of the kindergarten teachers. You are getting these results today. The kindergarten teachers in the state received them the day of or the day after the little ones completed the assessment. So they have been using that to inform and drive their instructional decisions since the day they administered the test. All of the boys and girls that scored 
uh, at that lower level, below the benchmark, have a read-at-home plan that was developed in the teacher and the parents together. And then they're using that to provide supports. Um, we are really working with principals, curriculum directors through our quarterly meetings to make sure they understand the importance of that collaboration, not only before the children come in that are external to us, but once they get there with kindergarten. So just really making what we call a seamless uh, connection across the the grades. In January, our goal is to bring back and share with you the prior enrollment information as we did last year so you can see how these kindergarten results look uh, depending on the placement and the prior uh, pre-k experience that boys and girls had. And the real key there is we're asking districts to look at that. We can give it to you to you in the aggregate, but they see individual faces and places and that they can actually have that uh, direct impact. We are continuing. We even met yesterday with the University of Mississippi um, and uh, MPB as to how we can continue to provide guides. Not only we have the K and pre-K family guides, but we want to provide those from birth to four. So we are going back and reaching and bridging that gap. And finally, uh, we want to continue to collaborate and will continue to collaborate not only at the state level but encouraging districts and schools to become part of these Excel by Five communities, the Campaign for Grade Level Communities. And Dr. Elam, you're familiar with that one that's in Oxford. Uh, and then that last bullet, and we talked at length about this in the subcommittee, using this data to change outcomes in classrooms in terms of instruction, but also now's the time you're making decisions at the district level of how you're going to staff your programs, how you're going to allocate your resources. Um, so we are really working, especially in the school improvement interview piece, Mr. Ransberg and his team as we look at uh, federal applications and reminding people of the evidence behind early childhood. Um, and as you can tell, I'm a little passionate about this, so I'm sorry I went a little bit long, but I did want you to see that and just kind of sum it up. Our children come in often, two out of three, not having those real solid foundational skills. The good news is thanks to the high quality instruction they're receiving in those classrooms, things get better. Things are getting better every year. So, questions? Not so much a question, just just to you know, I want to say job well done on this. I, I've Thank you. Have the uh, privilege of having a little kindergartner myself <laughs> in public school, Walker Lee, and uh, I got the letter, you know, after he took the test and read it, and you know, that's good. <laughs> yeah, and it was very easy to understand. And you Thank know, I was talking to my wife about it, and you know, he was excited about it. He sort of kind of knew what it was, and you know, talking about you know what happens next, and look look forward to the uh, to the post test too. So no question, Thank you. I just want to say you know as a parent. You know, it's, you know, it's easy to understand, and I, and I got it and understood what it was. Great work. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wright and board members, it is so easy. All of us see the impact that funding can have on pre-K. I'm delighted that you're asking for $10 million this year from the legislature. I hope that comes through. There may also be a grant available through NASB. The Kellogg Foundation is making some money is available for pre-K for states to apply for. And uh, nice. I've all, already made very clear that Mississippi <laughs> wants to be applied. So Perfect. Uh, we Perfect. hope that comes through as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that was good news and a good report. Any other questions or comments on this? I, I made this partly yesterday and Quentin and I had a brief little discussion in the staircase yesterday afternoon. We get $200 million for Title I. We could duplicate collaboratives for every child coming into kindergarten. $1,000 per student. It would cost $80 million. Get it done, Quentin. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments on that? Well, we're... We're at a stopping place. Our next item is going to uh, take a lot of discussion for, or generate a lot of discussion mm -hmm. probably. And so this is a good place to stop for lunch, even mm -hmm. though it's a little earlier than we normally stop. But I think um, it, 
rather than it run a long time and y'all be hungry and get irritated, we'll stop and have lunch here now. So, uh, you think 1230, is that 45 minutes? Will that work? That's fine. Okay, let's do that.
Okay, I believe we're on item five, Dr. Vanderford. Yeah, just a reminder, because uh, I've been reminded as well, please make sure you're speaking into your mics because it's the live streaming. They definitely need you to be right up front. Thanks. Um, item five is an information item only, and it's a report of the um, Mississippi Academic Assessment Program, or MAP, <coughs> uh, achievement gap results by subgroup. So as you know, in accordance with the uh, Every uh, Student Succeeds Act, uh, we are required to calculate and produce uh, achievement gap data by subgroup. And this achievement gap data has been calculated um, by the Office of District and School Performance. And it's been calculated using the uh, student achievement level at proficient and above. Um, we've calculated it for both state and district levels, the backup material that was provided to you has also been provided um, to each school district. And this is a comparison between the 2016 and the 2017 um, MAP results. So this item uh, references goals one, four, and six of the State Board of Education strategic plan. Do you have um, the, a copy of the, the short presentation that we have regarding this data? And we'll begin with the methodology. And so as I stated that um, this is for school years or for the accountability results from 2016 and 2017 um, using the MAP, ELA, and mathematics. And you'll see that the methodology um, only includes uh, the assessment information for the first attempt uh, that the student takes for each of the assessments. And if a student is enrolled in both, I mean, in the eighth grade and enrolled in Algebra One, um, as you know, they're required um, to take both tests. And so the data that you have includes the eighth grade um, assessment data. The next slide that um, is just a glimpse at the methodology that was used. Um, for, you know, you look at all the uh, test takers for the spring of 2017. As we mentioned, the first assessment attempt is used. Um, we select the ethical uh, student subgroup and calculate the percent um, proficient, and that's, as you know, achievement levels <coughs> four and five. Compute the gap or the difference in the uh, two groups, and then compute the change, which is the increase or the decrease um, for the gap in 2016 and 2017. The next slide is just an overview of the um, various subgroups, race, economic status, disability, um, English language status, and gender. And then um, taking a look at the results. Um, I just the, back up one slide because I think there's a key on that on one more slide that the board needs to note. Um, oh, oh. Notice the check mark there because that is the reference group. So when you are talking about African American uh, against whatever, it's white, Hispanic against white, um, and then the others are easy because it's, you know, it's either a student with disabilities or without the disability, but that's the reference group. So when you see these numbers, just realize that that's the reference group. Okay, sorry, get me Oh, no, thank you, that was a good, good point. Um, so the, the first slide under the um, results is the state level results for English language arts. And you'll see in the first column the subgroup and then the uh, gap in proficiency. And then the last column represents the gap change from 2016 to 2017. And if you notice um, the note at the bottom that an increase indicates that the gap widened um, and a negative symbol indicates, or a decrease indicates that the gap closed. So this is our overall state results for each of the subgroups. Have that at your table and back up into it. And the next slide is the same slide with uh, the exception of, it, instead of English language arts, this is mathematics.
we'll move into the uh, heat map that has been provided and this was in your backup material now you do not have the heat map in your handout and I think the heat map in your backup material actually begins on page 135 and so you'll see heat maps at the district level for ELA and math and this is a summary of the subgroup performance um, that was provided to the districts and um, the district level gap information is uh, provided in the form of a heat map for districts to have a quick reference and you have a slide the next slide that indicates um, what each of the colors represent so yellow is less than 10 percent the gold is 10 to 25 percent difference um, in the um, groups and the red indicates that the gap is greater than 25 percent one other thing to note if you're looking at your heat map um, the heat map was organized by the uh, accountability grade of the district so that's the reason you, and then put in alphabetical order so all the a's are you know on your heat map and then the b's and the c's etc cetera, etc cetera, and then they're by alpha underneath the um underneath the grade the grade is in the far right hand column of the heat map and then the last slide um, as it requires um, directives for states to identify and close gaps in the academic performance between these um, subgroups. And as part of our plan, um, we aim to eliminate or close the, the gaps um, in each of these areas, each of these groups, um, by the year 2025. this to districts in an effort um, for districts to have a focused uh, data analysis um, in order to align their interventions and uh, we're going to continue to monitor performance of these subgroups uh, throughout the year and we'll provide schools and districts with um, and this information provides schools and districts um, with the data necessary um, to develop their interventions in specific areas I want to give um, Brian Harvey from Oxford um, a real compliment. Uh, um, Oxford, if you recall, um, last year had uh, the largest gap in achievement um, amongst their subgroups. And when we did the celebration uh, with him, part of his celebration was the gaps that he is closing. And so he took the data that we gave him, identified the kids that needed the intervention, made sure that those kids got the intervention, and he has narrowed almost all of his gaps. So um, hats off to, to Brian Harvey for really taking it on and doing it in a very public way, and Dr. Elam was there to, to hear it. But I think this is exactly why, you know, I say all the time behind every data point there's a face, and you're not going to know what the right intervention is if you don't know who's behind that data point. And so here's a superintendent that really took it to heart, identified all these kids, and then made sure that they were getting the interventions that they deserved. So, which is I, I would point. add to that too that the that the Oxford community really got behind that. Yep. And, uh, That's true. Like being targeted, <clears throat> having the greatest gap. And I think that's critical. I think, and you're right. the The community really spoke up and said, "We've got to do something about it." And Brian Brian took it to heart. So. That's why the data are out there. It's not a finger pointing exercise, as I say all the time. The data are what the data are, but you've got to use the data in order to improve student achievement, and you've got to know who it is that needs what intervention. So, here we go. Remind me, um, economically disadvantaged, is that determined by free and reduced lunch? I, I thought, I wanted, didn't know if there were other factors that went into it, just that one factor. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, any questions or comments on this? <clears throat> All right, item six is beginning uh, the Administrative Procedures Act. This is to establish alternative quantity qualifications for non-educational prospective local superintendents. Dr. Manfred? 
In your backup material, um, you, along with the proposed uh, policy, you have the Senate Bill uh, 2398 of the 2017 legislation that charged uh, the State Board of Education with the development of these alternative qualifications for non-education non perspective um, superintendents of education. So the Office of Educator Licensure uh, was charged with convening a stakeholder group requirements of the statute and to uh, work with the development of uh, the policy. Uh, we also presented, um, Dr. Murphy uh, presented it to the Commission Licensure or Licensure Commission um, on November the 3rd and allowed uh, the Commission to um, ask questions and provide input. And then um, to, to further uh, add to the board item that you received, the Licensure Commission held a special called meeting the first week of December, a teleconference meeting, um, where Dr. Murphy went back and addressed the questions or um, the concerns that the Licensure Commission had regarding the policy. And at that time, they approved the policy uh, to be to submission for submission um, to you for approval. Page two of your backup. Um, has the proposed criteria and in the first uh, section um, an individual will receive an initial three-year alternative administrator license if they uh, meet the criteria of one having a master's degree or higher from an accredited institution and um, having a minimum of six years of documented successful leadership experience um, as determined and verified by the local school board that would appoint them um, it gives some examples of leadership type positions that would include but not limited to um, profit or not-for-profit organizations, state agencies, business industry, higher education or law, a senior leadership position such as a CEO, uh, senior military rank of captain or above. And this individual must also um, obtain a position as a district superintendent. So I'll just add here that we've had a lot of questions about why would the individual have to be appointed as a superintendent first before the agency would issue the license. And the rationale for that is because the license is only for three years and it's non-renewable in that form. So if we don't want to issue a license, if we issued a license January 1 um, when we're eligible, then the remainder of this school year, which is only half of the year, counts as the first year. Um, and so a lot of the time that the individuals eligible to hold the license could be spent looking for a job. So we want them to obtain the license first. And so although that three year um, is non-renewable, it would be converted to a standard license if the individual meets the criteria in the second uh, portion beginning at number four, so it would be successful completion of ongoing professional learning um, that's aligned to the responsibilities of local mm -hmm. district superintendents as outlined in state statute, or uh, they could demonstrate evidence that the district, in, um, by the district increasing its accountability rating uh, by a minimum of one performance classification during the three-year period in which the license holder uh, served as the superintendent. Um, if they were employed in the district with a C, D, or F performance classification. So four and five or an either or. And six, um, the criteria of six is just that they um, obtain a successful um, evaluation as already outlined um, in standard three of the Mississippi Public School Accountability Standards where um, superintendents are evaluated annually. So part of that moving in from converting to a standard license would require that they have um, met the evaluation criteria. Dr. Vandenberg, would you take me back to and, and, and tell me where you were when you were talking about the, the military pay grades? Um, yes, sir. That's under you. number two. Um, the policy um, cites examples that include but are not limited to. And so, um, Dr. Murphy may want to expand on this, but both the licensure, members of the licensure commission and the stakeholder thought that if we tried to develop a list, there would be no way that we could include um, every position and that we needed to give the local uh, school boards the opportunity to make that determination as long as they met the 
criteria of six years of successful and then cited some examples to include but not be limited to. My rationale for asking you to do that is because you mentioned captain, the pay grade captain. A captain for the Navy is something very different than a captain from the Air Force or the Army. You sort of say, uh, just saying captain, you, you would have to say 01, 02, 03, 04. For instance, a captain in, in, in the Navy is an 06. A captain in the Air Force is something very different, like an 02 or 03. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you need to you need to differentiate by saying 01, 02, 03, or whatever it is. And you can go to any military pay grade, and it'll give the differences for all of the services. I hope that's clear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Dean, Dr. Dean, you got to come. First of all, I want to congratulate you on this. This is this is I think this is a big deal. I mean, you know, so I want to make sure I understand it because because if it's how I understand it, I think this is a a huge step forward uh, and and really good policy that I think would potentially mitigate a looming administrative shortage. Some would say we, he's already a, a, you know here among us now, but certainly <clears throat> would be coming based on what you know how it's how it's always been. So let me let me restate what I think that, that I've heard here is that if if a local school district wanted to you know, consider a candidate as long as they meet these criteria specifically out here they can they can do so and once they're hired then they you know get this official you know um, three-year uh, certificate in which point they have further uh, professional development work to do within that three-year period to then get the full time so if you're the CEO of a company you're the president of a community college you're da 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 everything that's let's let's hear you are again it's all up to the local school board if they have someone who's you know there's the district they got all the Ed leadership and da da da. Then they're certainly, but they're now the <coughs> the applicant pool has been expanded in that. If you show some leadership based on this criteria, you are at least eligible to be considered for the job. That's a big deal. Once That's the a board, big deal. And once the board hires that individual, then we will grant the license for three years, and the individual has three years to either meet number four. Um, and, and with the professional development, or they have three years to improve the accountability rating, which would qualify them, so along with getting the superintendent evaluation in number six. So instead of the narrow, you know, this is how it now the franchise opens up, and let the best man or woman get the job, whoever you know is most most capable. And man, great work. I, I think one thing uh, to go along with this is school boards, uh, and we, I guess work with the school board association. Uh, need to be educated on this because now if you come apply for a job and you don't have a license they're not going to hire you so, and actually um, the school board association served um, as a member of the stakeholder convening so um, they did have input in the development of this criteria so it was um, it, it was difficult at times because you know we we as educators um, you know we want individuals to have met the same criteria that, that we met and so it's, it was really uh, I guess hard to um, at times to get the entire group to come back and focus around the intent of the legislation um, and so uh, we feel like there's as much flexibility in this policy that that could have been allowed. And to your point Dr. Dean one thing that we could also do and I know they'd be willing to do this because they're great folks um, is during one of their either fall or spring conference um, have us do a presentation at a breakout or the time together because they're always very open to our participation. This might be a good way to have an audience to, to let them know what, what's We're already on the agenda for that. There you is, go. This is one of our items. All right. That's very good. Mr. Brink. Uh, Paul, looking at number five, <clears throat> either four or five could be utilized. Yes, what sir. if they're either hired four. in an A or a B district? Well, well, then they would have to meet the professional development opportunity. So they're, yeah. they wouldn't so, have two so options. They're limited. They'd only you're, have you're, one option. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. They would have the, they would have to go the option of four, number four with the professional development opportunity. This is just to begin APA. The action is just to begin APA. About that one. Because I mean, guys pointed in a C, D, or F. You know, you give him another. You give him two options to work himself out of it, and the other guy may do an outstanding job in maintaining and or improving, but yet they can't use that option. So. 
say that the pool in an A B district would probably be larger and attractive <laughs> than, than the other. Leadership's good leadership though. Probably have a lot more applicants in an A B district than you would in a C D or F. Okay. Any more questions or comments on that? <clears throat> so I just want to comment to the board before we release it in APA, we'll go back and um uh, look at the the suggestion that Dr. Kelly made to clarify that. Clarify so, the rank. Um, mm -hmm. so if you see it in APA, um, we'll, we'll, that language will Spelled be added. Mm -hmm. sure. This process. When, when's, when would this come out? What's the process for APA, and when will it come back to us for vote for official? In January. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, item seven. This is our final estimate on uh, MAEP base student cost we have two two items on that the first one is the base student cost for uh, fy 219. uh as uh mrs altman chair altman said items seven and eight go together and the state board is required you saw the preliminary numbers on these back in july you approve those as a part of our FY19 budget request. So we're seeking approval on the program-based student cost for FY19, as well as the final uh, MAAP estimate for 2019. And of course, we're seeking full funding for MAAP. And Donna Nestor, our Director of School Financial Services, will present that information to you. Pardon me just a minute. You do have a folder at your places that has tab 7 and 8 information. It's covered it up. Okay, Donna. Good afternoon. Um, following the statute, MDE is required to have an independent CPA firm conduct that um, calculation, and so I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Scott Hodges, who is here representing the firm of Tam Brown and Russ. They currently hold a contract for that calculation, and so um, he is a great backup partner here for me today. <laughs> so I want to welcome him. Um, I, I would also like to explain um, why you did not have this in your board backup as soon as maybe you would have liked it. The timeline for this is very, very tight. The MAEP by law is calculated off of months two and three data, and that is the October, November months of this year. And that was just um, closed last Thursday at noon. And that gave the department one one day on Friday for the program offices to evaluate some of that data before they made their projections for teacher units and some of those add-on programs and then it was delivered to the firm on Monday and so you know we greatly limited his time with the data to get this rather large calculation made and so um, it is hot off the presses into your hands today and that's why um, I do apologize it's not able to be in your backup document when it's uh, or backup data when it is mailed out but we get it to you just as quickly as we can as soon as the calculation is prepared. So you will recall that um, in most years we spend quite a bit of time talking about the MAEP calculation, which is the Mississippi Adequate Education Program. Um, this year was a full recalculation year for the base student cost, which is the primary building block for the um, calculation. And so I think it's important that we spend a little bit of time talking about base student cost this year because that only occurs every four years. And so um, just to remind you a little bit about the criteria for the base student cost, that is calculated on districts, or it's calculated for every district, but only on those districts who are considered successful and efficient. And to be successful, they must have a grade of C from the most recent accountability results, which would be from the 17 school year. Student attendance and district staffing is also pulled in to determine which districts are considered efficient as it relates to one standard deviation above and two standard deviations below the state average in four component areas, instruction, administration, plant operation and maintenance, and ancillary programs. On average, we have about 35 districts that are selected as both successful and efficient, and then that criteria, we pull their financial information in and begin to calculate the <coughs> student cost. Um, in 17, the, um, we had some shifts, as you can imagine, over a four-year period of data. So if you would look at page two of your handout, we'll start with the summary of the base student cost for the 19 final estimate. As calculated, the amount comes to 
and 97 cents. I have a little more detail on a later page to detail some of the components that went into that, but I do want to mention that at the same time, each year that we calculate the base student cost, we are to consider other factors that may come into place, and this year there will be an increase in the employer share of the health insurance premium. And so we have also calculated the, the component for that, and that's the additional $28.69 that we're adding into the base student cost. If we don't make an adjustment for that, then school districts would wait four years before they would see any compensation through their state funding for an expense that's being implemented in the 19th school year. So that brings the, um, the final total then for base student cost to 5,522.66. I'm so thankful for that number because that's going to be easy to remember. 552266. <laughs> I'm going to be able to quote that one all the time. Um, if you wouldn't mind going then to page four of your handout, we'll just stay with the base student cost for just a moment. As I mentioned, we only recalculate it every four years. And so 15 was the last time that it was fully recalculated in those components. So you will see that um, there was a, a great deal of increase, so to speak, from 15 to 19. But then if you look at the individual components, um, I mean, in total, it was $403 that increased from 15 to 19. I think it might be important to note that on the interim years, we add an inflation component. Had this not been a, recon, um, a recalculation year and we had only added inflation, the base student cost before the insurance adjustment would have been 5426 So we're not way off doing a recalculation than if we had simply added the inflation component. But, of course, the law dictates that we do a recalculation. So I just wanted to um, list that there um, to show you how those different components come in. I know that in many cases, um, the formula is examined quite heavily on the administrative component, and so you can see that uh, over a four-year range, the administrative component increased $114 uh, in the 19th school year. Then when you add the insurance premium increase, as you can see over the history of the years, we've added other increases for teacher pay raises or an increase to the PERS contribution, so right in line with some of those things that happen. Um, so that's on the base student cost. So before we move on into the um, full funding calculation for MAP, are there any questions maybe about the process or the amount on the base student cost? Okay, well we'll move on to the larger number, which is MAEP. Um, and, and I apologize to our newest board member. I know I'm using a lot of acronyms, and I'll try to spell them out as we go forward. No problem. Our profession is bad at having acronyms, are they not? That's part of his uh, boot camp. His training, that's right. Being confused trial by for the fire, first few just jump right in. That's, that's right. Um, if you wouldn't mind going back then to page three, the summary of the MAE co MAEP cost calculation for 19 um, and the base formula, we'll talk a lot about the base formula, and that is just when we go through and we use the um, average daily attendance and the at-risk component, local contribution, and a whole harmless guarantee. That is what's made up of the um, base formula. The base formula for this year is going to be 1930356826 that's an increase of about 18 million over the FY18 request. The add-on programs, which includes alternative education, career and technical, gifted education, special education, and transportation amounts to 5,020,174,804. And then our other programs, which includes our university-based, our university-based um, SPED transportation, non-public dyslexia scholarships, and non-public textbooks, bus driver training, an extended school year amounts to 13537694 And that brings us to the whopping total of 2,464,069,326. There are some breakdowns for your um, information in the next box below there that just gives you a little bit of breakdown about those different component pieces that we talked about in the add-on programs and the other programs. For instance, in special education, there are 5,933 teacher units that are being projected for the 19 school year, and that's an increase um, over the 18 school year of 5,800 units. So that feeds into some of the components of this calculation being a little larger than last year. Any questions then on those, those items? 
Okay, if you move back to page four, you'll see at the bottom of the page there is a summary of the increase in the base formula and in the total formula cost from year to year over the period of last four years. Just to give you a little idea of what, what the formula amount has, um, how that cycle has ranged. And this year is an increase um, in total of $29 million. On the very last page of your handout, um, again, just another breakdown to show you how we come forward from the 18 cost, some of how the um, individual components affect the calculation in total. So average daily attendance um, this year was down in attendance. Um, and remember, that's not enrollment, that's attendance data. But um, the ADA was down about 5,000 points, and so that affected the calculation by about $30 million to drive it down. And by the time everything is totaled back out, we are back to the 29 million increase. And then there are the percentages listed there at the bottom for those different programs. But that's also the exact reason why we've been pushing for um, ADM, average daily membership, versus ADA, average daily attendance. Because this looks like we've lost children and we have not. So on any given day when ADA is calculated, if it's flu season, then you're down X number of kids. Uh, but these are still kids that are enrolled, and you still have to provide teachers and electricity and all the above. So we've really been pushing hard to get ADA replaced with ADM. All right, um, Dr. Dane. Wait, good, uh, great presentation. Uh, Twenty-nine million over last year increase. Full funding request. Okay, so that's that's why I was trying to. I mean, we do this every year. Everybody in this room, <laughs> yeah, get ready. So. Uh, I, I think you, you you probably can anticipate my question better than I can ask it. I want to know what the increase would be if it was full funding and what it is based on what we got last year to this year. Does that does that question make sense to you? So last year our funding request, of course, we were twenty nine million above on the nineteen as we were on the full funding request for eighteen. The eighteen request was funded at ninety one percent. So that amount was two billion two twenty one. So compared to what we are requesting this year at two billion four sixty four. So two hundred two hundred million. Okay, so that that you, you, that's what I'm trying to get to. So full funding up to the you know codified MAP formula would be roughly two hundred million dollars. But we're twenty asked twenty nine million above last year. Right. But we we present the full funding and then. So each year the comparison is full funding to full funding to make sure we stay apples to apples. Any other questions or comments on this? Well, no, that's right. <laughs> Our deadline for um, <coughs> submitting this to the legislature is January 2nd, so following today's board meeting, we'll take this across and deliver it and um, see what happens. Thank you for your work. I know that was quick, but I can tell you, having worked with Scott uh, for, what, 20 years, I can tell you he has looked at every penny, so <laughs> the numbers are accurate right down to the last Walmart receipt was always my <laughs> joke. So, <laughs> all right, Ooh. thank you. Thank you. So we've covered item seven, back to my agenda, seven and eight. Uh, with that presentation. Uh, so we're at item nine, consent agenda. Any, um, any questions on consent agenda? Me. <laughs> I don't know. My head just automatically pops over there. I'm going to give you a Christmas present. I, I mean, you're I doing great. Right. You're doing good. I, told you, I, I went to church last night. <laughs> well, you need to go every day to Mass. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the result. I, I, I need to take some company with me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll move then into our vote. Um, under the Office of Chief Operations Officer, do I have a motion to approve item one? Item one is um, 
includes the money. Yeah, the together. contracts. Yeah, you want to separate them? They are, let's do, uh, we can do them together. They're both contracts if you want to. Uh, do we need two votes or can we? All right, doing separately. First one is the monthly contracts. Do we have a motion to approve monthly contracts? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Oh. Um, item B is the contract for Dr. Uh, Domaleski, who provides technical assistance. Do we have a motion to approve that? Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Oh. Okay, under the Office of Chief Operations Officer, would we have a motion to approve item two? These are our grants, or the MCOPS grant. Okay, is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, item uh, three is um, under the Office of State Superintendent, a motion to approve recommendation one. Or recommendation two, and I think on this, you want to make the motion to I, remove um, number two. I have a clarifying okay. uh, to my earlier motion. Uh, <clears throat> in light of the governor's uh, decisions and the efforts around uh, JPS, particularly with the uh, Better Together Commission uh, designed to enhance and support the Jackson Public School District, I move that the State Board of Education reject recommendation two for the three districts and strike those from the Achievement School District Planning Committee's options uh, for the Mississippi Achievement School District. We have a motion and second. That is that we reject the uh, recommendation number two from the commission. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, do we have a motion as it relates to uh, recommendation one, which is the two school districts? Madam Chair, I I would move that we um, we defer a recommendation on uh, well we defer action is what I should say we defer action on recommendation one until such time as the new superintendent for the Achievement School District has been named. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed. Aye. Yes. Motion carries. All right, then item um, four, under the Office of Chief Accountability Officer, do we have a motion to, uh, wait a minute, six. item six, I'm sorry, to approve item six? Approve. This, okay. Second. A process. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed. Okay, I under the Office of Chief Operations Officer, do we have a motion to approve items seven and eight? Those relate to MAEP. We can take those in one motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. Okay, under consent agenda, we need a motion to approve items B, C, D, E, F, G. And H. <clears throat> okay. Motion. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Uh, now we will consider uh, moving into an executive session. Do we have a motion as it relates to entering executive session? Can I make a motion to make a determination to move into executive session? We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed. Okay. Uh, who do you? Who do? You, yeah. Who? Who do? You,
an update on legal matters and uh, approve the appointment of Sharon Roselle as an Education Bureau Director too in the Office of Budget. So uh, that was the only action taken during um, the executive session. Um, do we have a motion? I have no other business, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, okay. We can go home and have a Merry question. Christmas. I know we've adjourned. Three or four years ago, we started the legislative dinner around Christmas time, the end of the year. Are we not going to do that again? Did we opt not to do that? Eat. Wanted to schedule it. I think after the speaker after, names the Ed Chair. Yeah, start to say Oh, that's everything. a great idea. Yeah. After the speaker names yeah. the Ed Chair. I would I would just like yeah. to we see need us to do not that once discontinue we, yeah. that tradition. Yeah. Do you have Oh okay. 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 I'd like yeah. that request that's called.